the passengers of a crashed plane are stranded in a vast desert with no water and minimal chances of survival. Somewhere deep in the Mongolian desert, work is being done to find oil. Soon it turns out that there is no black gold here and the oil company closes one of its wells, firing all its personnel. Captain Frank Towns is flown in for the workers, who must transport them back on a rickety plane. The head of the work crew, Callie Johnson, protests the shutdown, but her boss, Ian, and Frank ignore her outrage. Moreover, on her return to Beijing, she faces termination for giving the wrong coordinates and wasting valuable company resources on a search for non-existent oil deposits. The team winds down their hardware and boards the plane. A young boy, John, puts on a cap and makes a wish for good luck. You know I do this when I get on a plane. It's good luck, all right? I ain't crashed yet. You keep talking like that, bro, you're gonna jinx us. There is immediate animosity between the ordinary workers and their transporters. Ian doesn't really want to sit next to the simple worker, so he suggests that Alex Rodney move to the back with the other workers. In the last minutes before departure, a weird-looking guy named Elliot shows up at the well site, whom the captain also agrees to pick up from the desert. Frank and his co-pilot A, J, take the plane into the sky. The passengers chat lightheartedly among themselves, sharing pictures of their loved ones who are waiting for them to return home. Suddenly, a huge sandstorm sweeps through the desert and A, J, anxiously awaits his partner's orders. Frank has no intention of wasting time. If we go back, we'd have to get refueled. God knows how long that'd take. The captain gives the order to gain altitude to fly over the storm. The passengers are startled by the sudden jolt, but A, J, assures them that everything is under control. Nevertheless, the frightened Elliot bursts into the cockpit and tells them that the plane is too overloaded to fly over the sandstorm. However, the overconfident captain ignores his warnings and rudely tells the passenger to get lost. As a result, Frank fails to calculate his own abilities and the capabilities of the aircraft, which leads to unfortunate consequences. When he encounters the storm, the engines begin to fail and shut down, and the pilots completely lose control of the plane. J hits the hull during a turn. The tail of the plane breaks off as it collides with a cliff and part of the cargo, along with a worker who was checking to see if everything was secure, flies overboard at blazing speed and crashes onto the cliffs. They crash in the middle of the Mongolian desert, causing the plane to be severely damaged and most of its components to shatter on impact. The crew members and most of the passengers manage to survive the crash. Frank informs the workers that their radio is busted and communication with the outside world has been lost. However, he reassures those present that they are going to be missed soon, as their plane has not arrived for its scheduled refueling. Meanwhile, the sandstorm completely covers the flying machine. The crew humbly waits for it to subside so they can try to escape. Ian tries to call someone on the phone, which causes John to laugh. The boss irritatedly blames the guy for the plane crash and says he jinxed them with his ritual. The storm subsides and the team makes their way outside. In honor of the two employees who flew out of their plane, makeshift crosses are placed in the desert. The team asks Captain Towns to give a farewell speech, but he can't find the words because he didn't know the men. Elliot is the only one present who realizes that the casualties could have been avoided and is not afraid to sarcastically hint that to the pilots. You're looking to join those two? Keep it up. Jay asks Kelly who this strange guy is. The woman says he came out of nowhere a week ago and introduced himself as a traveler. He couldn't fly out of the desert on his own, so he joined the work crew. After recovering from the initial shock, the passengers make an inventory. According to Frank's calculations, they should have enough water supplies for a month if they consume half a liter per person per day and conserve strength and energy. Fortunately, all the food supplies are in canned form, which will keep the team alive for a while until help arrives. The bad news, however, is that the plane went off course during the crash and the nearest settlement is several hundred kilometers away. A sporty worker named Jeremy says he can get there on foot, but he doesn't know about the peculiarities of the Gobi Desert. And let me warn you, July is the hottest month in the Gobi. You will be taking a pint of water and you'll sweat 10. The man does not give up and says he will walk during the chill of the night, but the team again crushes his hopes. The dunes are constantly on the move so he will just walk in circles and eventually get lost amidst the sands. As night falls, a desert storm breaks out. Young John can't sleep because of guilt, feeling earnestly guilty about jinxing the team. He goes outside to relieve himself, and a strong wind instantly carries him to an unknown destination. At this point, the team's worst fears come true. The guy paces from one direction to the next in a panic, trying to spot the way back to the plane, but the treacherous desert leaves him there forever. In the morning, the team wakes up to find John missing. Finding no sign of him, they are horrified to realize that the guy has been swept away by the desert. 
His partner Alex wants to go in search of his friend, but Callie and Frank prevent him from the ruinous venture. This event makes the passengers fully aware of the dangerous situation they find themselves in. Kelly learns from the captain that the likelihood that they will be found by rescuers is minimal. The woman offers to try to find a way out of the desert, but Frank is adamant. We are in the middle of a desert with yeah, no radio, I very know. little water, even less food. If we try to walk out of here, we're going to last about two days. Kelly tries to influence the captain and says that the whole crew is relying on him, but he doesn't want to take responsibility and rudely chases the woman away. Meanwhile, the surviving passengers begin to speculate that no one is coming for them. Ian is confident that the corporation will rescue them, but Kelly reminds him that they fired dozens of people without regret after learning that there is no oil in the desert. After assessing the profitability of the rescue operation, the big company is unlikely to agree to waste a budget on finding some ordinary workers. Panic ensues among the crew. Ian and another passenger plan to leave, taking a canister of water with them. The other survivors attack them, trying to stop them. All this leads to the canister bursting and the life-giving liquid spilling out onto the sand. Suddenly Elliot starts whistling, drawing attention to himself. He tells the team that he knows how to get out of the desert. All this time he has been carefully studying the construction of the plane and has come to the conclusion that it can be rebuilt. He suggests that the assembled team construct a new aircraft from salvaged spare parts. The crew is skeptical of his proposal, thinking that it is not feasible. But Elliot reveals a truth about himself that causes the passengers to change their minds. What do you know about airplanes? I designed them, Mr. Towns. That's what I know about airplanes. The passengers get their hopes up, but Frank convinces them that they won't survive, working under the scorching sun and with minimal provisions. He tells everyone to do nothing to conserve their strength until the rescuers arrive. Not everyone agrees to this plan, and at dawn it becomes known that James has decided to leave. Kelly plans to go after him, not wanting to lose another colleague. The captain stops her and reluctantly sets out to find the missing man, wandering for long hours across the vast desert. Eventually he reaches a quarry, where he discovers the wreckage of their plane. Among it lies a mutilated man's body, next to which Frank finds bullet casings. James suddenly appears behind the captain's back and tells him that the victim is one of the passengers who fell out of the plane. He must have had an expensive watch on his hand, which James lost to him in a poker game. Apparently, smugglers visited the crash site and looted it. A heartfelt conversation ensues between the men, and James admits that he does not believe in salvation. However, he believes that they have a chance to build a plane, they just have to try. But the captain doesn't want to risk giving people false hope. James says that the crew needs something to believe in in order to keep from going crazy. He says his family is waiting for him at home and he is willing to cross the desert alone to see them again. Frank asks him to return to the group and promises to start building the plane. At first the worker doesn't believe in the captain's sincerity, then the man decides to make a wager with him. Here, take it. You can give it back when we get home. Meanwhile, everyone in the camp is sunk in sad thoughts, no longer hoping to see the men again. Suddenly Jeremy notices two silhouettes in the distance, and the passengers run happily toward them. Frank announces that they are going to build the plane and asks Elliot to develop a new design. He also tells each passenger to actively participate in the construction process, to which they unanimously agree. At night, the crew gets to work, lighting fires in barrels to illuminate everything around them. Everyone is full of energy and successfully manages the difficult work of taking the plane apart. By morning, everyone feels very tired and notices that they have drank twice as much water. Construction work is done only at night to avoid the heat and to save water. On one such night, a spark from a fire accidentally hits a barrel of gasoline, and a powerful explosion occurs. This leaves almost no fuel and Frank informs the team that they will have to work during the day, using more water. The group is not thrilled with the idea, but in daylight their productivity improves and construction speeds up. Elliot gives the group a daunting task, to join the two parts of the airplane's wing. He entrusts this to Sammy, who used to work as a regular cook. Sammy climbs inside the wing to attach the desired part. In the process, an accident occurs and the other part of the wing comes off its fasteners. The team freezes in horror, thinking the cook has passed away. However, within seconds, Sammy appears before them, smiling, having successfully accomplished his task. Over the course of the construction, the team becomes even more united and finds reason to rejoice even in the harsh desert conditions. Only Frank and Elliot continue to argue about deadlines. In the evening, it begins to rain in the desert, which at first pleases the heat-weary workers. But the first roar of thunder makes the captain shudder at the impending danger. Their plane is still not grounded, and there is residual fuel inside. If lightning strikes it, there will be an explosion and they will be left in the desert forever. He and two workers pull out a coil of metal cable and hastily bury it in the sand. The team escapes to safety while the hapless Elliot fails to get off the wing of the plane in time. 
Frank saves the aircraft designer at the last minute by jumping to the ground with him. Thanks to the grounding, the lightning bolt hits nearby. During a workday, the team names the new plane Phoenix as a symbol of the rebirth from the ashes. Later, Jay urgently summons everyone and reports that someone is secretly stealing water. He's been taking measurements of the supplies for days and notices that they're running out too fast. Elliot admits that he is the one drinking the water. He considers his actions justified, as he works at night while the others are sleeping soundly. Frank attacks the designer, but he reminds him that they need his help to finish the plane and get out of the desert. Everyone here is dispensable except me. After a hard day's work, Kelly leaves the crew to get some rest. Suddenly, she hears suspicious noises and discovers a human camp nearby. Kelly immediately informs the team, and Frank and his two workers decide to go on a reconnaissance mission. After investigating, they discover that some smugglers have set up camp. The men decide to negotiate with them to ask for help. Elliot tries to talk them out of the rash venture, but once again his words are ignored by everyone. Chief Ian, Jay, and Alex head toward the camp, while Frank is backing them up from above with a gun. Ian, in a broken foreign dialect, tries to explain to the smugglers the purpose of their arrival, but doesn't understand a word they answer. Meanwhile, James follows Frank and screams as he notices his watch on the wrist of one of the smugglers. The negotiating bandit pulls out his gun and fires. <laughs> Enraged, Frank instantly fires on the smugglers, but one of them manages to escape. The wounded Alex is brought to camp, but Kelly tearfully tells him that he can no longer be helped. Soon the man passes away and the team buries him next to the others. While inspecting the enemy camp, one of the surviving smugglers shoots Kelly in the leg. He is brought to the plane and the team begins to argue about what to do with him next. Elliot comes out to the group and solves their problem by eliminating the bandit with a shot to the head. A new argument erupts between him and the captain. The designer accuses Frank of making a series of bad decisions and reminds him that it was his actions that caused the plane to crash. Now the scuffle with the smugglers has caused them to lose one man and disrupt their work schedule. Frank can't stand it and silences his opponent by force. Work on the plane freezes and Elliot tells the crew that he has lost interest in it because of their disrespectful treatment of him. He forces everyone present to admit that he is the leader of the group. Who's the boss of everyone? You are, Elliot. After this, the work resumes and Elliot hands out instructions to all the men. The entire time the smugglers are watching them from afar, waiting for the crew to run out of steam and let their guard down. After a while, he announces to those present that the plane is completely ready. The joyful workers begin to pack their bags and prepare for the flight. The captain wants to get a map of the area from Elliot's backpack, but accidentally stumbles upon a brochure of the company for which he works. So it turns out that the man has never actually built real airplanes, but has only been designing small aircraft models. This news leads the team to panic because they have spent so many resources to build a bogus design. However, Elliot desperately tries to convince everyone that large planes are built on the same principle and their phoenix can fly. His words do not convince the furious workers, and everyone lashes out at the man with accusations. Exhausted, Ian picks up a revolver and intends to shoot the lying designer. For because of him, their food and water supplies are running low, and now there is no chance of salvation. Frank manages to stop his boss at the last moment and takes the weapon out of his hands. Suddenly a violent sandstorm breaks out in the desert, interrupting the crew's quarrel. The wind begins to lift the hull of the plane, clearly demonstrating to those around it that it can take off. I told you. I told you. The crew hides from the storm in the fuselage, having miraculously survived the inclement weather. Once outside, they find the plane half buried under the sand and lose hope again. However, Frank gives an inspirational speech and tells the crew to dig the plane out. They have come too far and must not give up before returning home. The motivated workers hook ropes to the plane and pull it out of the sand on their shoulders. Before departing, Frank and Elliot finally shake hands. The crew wishes the captain good luck and stands still in anticipation. He only has five rounds to manually start the engine. The first few attempts fail, and the propeller stops spinning immediately after starting. Then Frank decides to use one of the bullets to clean the plane's engine. Elliot warns him that they only have two rounds left, but this time the captain realizes the risks. The passengers decide once again to trust him. He starts the engine and gives it fuel to burn. Flames burst from the propeller several times, but in the end the plan works. On his fifth attempt, Frank manages to get the plane started, which gets the crew excited. Yes, we make our own yes, the survivors climb aboard, and the plane begins to move, but then the armed smugglers appear on the horizon. On horseback, they rush straight at the group and damage the steering wheel with a shot. Frank loses control and asks Elliot to put the steering wheel back in place. The designer, dodging bullets, crawls across the plane and puts the rudder back in its proper position. The moment of truth arrives. The plane moves at full speed toward a cliff, after which it plummets down. The smugglers stop, thinking that their plunder is about to crash. 
However, contrary to their expectations, the plane begins to gain altitude and soars into the sky against the beautiful sunset. The team rejoices and congratulates each other. This is how the incredible rescue tale ends and all the Phoenix's passengers successfully return home to their loving families. What would you do if you were in the shoes of the main characters? Write about it in the comments and subscribe to our channel.